our presenter today is uh, Dr. Paul Meek. Uh, Paul's been working in the ecology field for over 30 years in positions throughout Australia and overseas, including three years on Christmas Island. Uh, he currently works for New South Wales Department for Primary Industries in the Vertebrate Pest Research Unit and Project Leader with the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. Uh, Paul completed his undergraduate degree at Roseworthy in South Australia, a master's degree on the biology and ecology of foxes, free roaming dogs and cats in Jervis Bay at University of Canberra and completed his PhD at the University of New England on camera trapping. He was awarded the Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Award for his PhD research. He holds a position as an adjunct lecturer with the University of New England, University of Sydney, and an adjunct senior fellow at the University of Queensland. Primary work roles are research and development, contributing to pest management policy that integrates new research findings into control and monitoring. His focus is on research that benefits pest management and impact monitoring and developing best practice. Areas of expertise include camera trapping, predator trapping, small mammal trapping, radio tracking, fox, wild dog and feral cat ecology, uh, Hastings River mouse and Christmas Island shrew ecology and inland rodent eradication. Uh, Paul is also a fellow of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Dingoes in the Cooper Basin. Over to you. OK, is that up on your screen? Yep. Great. OK, um, so the second presentation is um, research that I've been conducting in the Cooper Basin since 2015 or so until the current time. Um, we've done many different projects uh, in that area because of the, the nature of the dingo population in and around uh, the mine site in the Cooper Basin. But importantly, it's been a very useful research site for us to work on trying to improve animal welfare outcomes for predators, in this case, uh, dingoes and wild dogs, uh, using soft jaw traps. So I thought I might just go through very, very quickly and give an overview of um, trapping in Australia and, and why we've started to um, work in the areas that we have. I think the important caveat here is that um, foothold trapping has been around for a long time and it's a resource and a tool and a method that uh, we would like to see continue to be available to land managers, to trappers, to national parks people, to researchers. Um, and in order for that to happen, it's very important that we are um, developing and encouraging best practice that aims to minimise the um, the uh, the, the trapping conditions that people are, are that animals are being trapped under, the types of traps they're using, um, you know, the the check the trap checking and all those sorts of things. And I think it's um, quite pertinent to talk about this given the uh, the, the the recent um, ABC report um, from from Victoria. So I'll just um, I'll finish off the talk by giving you a little bit of an overview of some really interesting radio tracking work that we've done in this same area, which is um, an extension of uh, of the work that you've just seen for the Western Tracks area. So the main focus of our work has been uh, free ranging dogs, so wild dogs, dingoes, depending on which uh, you want to call them. Um, that's been a major driver for a lot of our work because they um, uh, are known to have impacts on livestock and uh, they're a source of a great amount of effort to uh, manage and control right across the country, but in certainly in New South Wales and, and South Australia and Victoria. But we're, all of this work we do is also very relative to red foxes and also to feral cats, because all three of those species are trapped across the country um, using soft jaw traps. 
So there's, you know, we've, we've, we're fairly new country when it comes to um, the culture of trapping. Obviously, if you look in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, traps have been used for a very, very long time. Um, in Australia, really, it's you know, from the 1800s uh, ongoing. Started initially with doggers and rabbiters um, in early colonisation for pelts and for food. Um, and then we saw the first professional trappers coming into the system in New South Wales in the 1890s. Um, and it wasn't until the 1980s and 90s in Western Australia that we actually saw formal dogger contractor groups. And then we had this, with the rise of the internet, we had this um, weekend warrior trapping brigade start where um, people that um, previously would not have had an interest in trapping gained access to traps and trapping equipment and videos on the internet. And all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of new people coming in, trapping and, um, and in many areas causing lots of problems uh, for, for professional people. Um, in the 1970s, we started to see some of the early pioneers like Brian Coleman from Victoria and Peter Bird from South Australia, Alan and Bob from New South Wales, starting to look at um, dingoes and trapping practices. And then in the 80s, a whole bunch of us jumped on the bandwagon and started to um, try and see whether there were more humane ways to achieve the same outcomes using trapping as a tool, but trying to make it as humane as we possibly could for the animals that were captured. It was in that period there that um, I actually uh, imported Victor Softcatch traps and worked with David Jenkins and a trapper from Wee Jasper, Bill Morris. And we started testing efficacy of uh, Victor Softcatch traps versus Lane's traps because there was a lot of controversy over whether they would actually do the job, Victor's, whether, whether Victor's would do the job of a steel jaw trap. And we've continued with that work ever since. Um, steel jaw traps were subsequently banned in the 1980s. Obviously, they were modified for a little while, but uh, they're no longer permissible uh, across all of the states. Rubber jaw traps started to be seen quite commonly in the 90s and on onwards. Um, in Australia, the only kill traps uh, allowed are for rats and mice. We are not allowed to have kill traps in this country, unlike they do in. North America, which I think is um, is probably a good thing. Snares are not widely used, and in some places they're not legal. And cage traps are used by some people, although not as efficient as using uh, foothold traps. There are um, many, many uh, types of um, foothold traps available in this country. This is um, a, a large portion of them, but certainly not all of them. These are all steel traps with uh, offset jaws, uh, rubber pads, and a variety of different mechanisms of closure from having a dog to having little trigger mechanisms on the jaw, and often and should always be with swivels and, and short chains that are um, staked to the ground or in some cases are uh, put on drags. There's a rough... Um, a bunch of traps. The top left corner is the old lane steel jaw trap, now prohibited from use. Um, the Victor number three, which is the one of the more common traps used, or lanes or bridges are the other equivalents in other states. And then this interesting trap here, which is called the treadle snare or the banjo trap, which is a Victorian invention in the 90s by Stevens, I think his name was, um, which was a cable snare cross um, dog type trap where you've got a, a, um, a, uh, a dog mechanism here and a spring mechanism that throws the cables up. Uh, there, I don't know anyone who uses those anymore. There's lots of legislation um, covering animal welfare and trapping and it changes constantly. Some of the earliest laws were based around domestic animals. It wasn't until the 70s when um, the RSPCA pushed very hard to have Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act and trapping was included in that legislation. Since that time, there have been every state trying to walk, work towards um, setting 
best practice guidelines to uh, ensure that trapping can continue, but to try and minimise the the impact um, on the animals that are that are captured. And right across the board, it is generally accepted that 24-hour uh, trap checking is mandatory. Where that's not possible, there are um, other options for using um, toxins. Um, and a lot of these best practices um, are described in codes of practice and standard operating procedures, which are available on the, on the internet. The toxin of choice in the past for, um, uh, for dog trapping has been strychnine. And, and essentially, um, the reason for that has been that, you know, South Australia and New South Wales and uh, other states have got long distances where traps are deployed into very remote parts of the country and getting around to those traps every 24 hours um, is impossible. So um, strychnine has been the, the most commonly used toxin that is applied to the jaws of traps. And the idea being that when a dog is trapped, they'll try and um, gnaw the, uh, the trap off of the foot and subsequently get a dose of strychnine and, um, and make their maker um, as quickly as, as, uh, as possible um, so that they're not left in a trap for days on end or having to suffer through extreme conditions of weather and so forth. In more recent times, we've been working on an alternative to strychnine called PAP, um, primarily because there is a global push to phase out strychnine on the grounds that it is uh, not a very pleasant way to die. One of these projects um, that I ran was in the Cooper Basin, looking at what we just refer to generally as lethal trap devices. They were designed around um, devices that the Americans had, had um, um, been using for quite some time called TTDs or uh, tranquilizer trap devices, where they put a tranquilizer inside of a capsule on a jaw trap and the same principle when the animal was caught, they'd chew at the, uh, the rubber nipple that was sitting on it and get a, um, uh, a dose of tranquilizer, which would um, put them to sleep. We wanted to take that to the next level to see whether we could develop lethal trap devices that would be fatal and put animals out of, um, uh, put animals to sleep um, soon after capture. So we started working on these devices here, which we call Bite Me. If you look in this top figure, that is a American TTD. We did try and use them, but they had a rubber stopper here, which kept coming out and releasing the toxins. So there was issues with non-target. So together with our uh, colleagues, Conovation in New Zealand and Siltec in Auckland, we designed uh, these types of nipples here, which we just call Bite Me. Um, they attach to the jaw of the trap and the toxin is contained inside of this nipple, which sits proud on the, uh, the jaw of the trap and an easy target for dogs, foxes and cats to take off. But one of the first things we were worried about was whether putting these uh, LTDs on uh, trap jaws would actually slow the speed down and therefore be an impediment to trappers uh, who were worried that they would um, lose animals because of the extra weight of the, um, the, the nipple on the jaw. So we did some incredibly innovative um, high speed uh, video camera footage of um, two types of traps. One, the large bridger, because that was a trap commonly used um, in um, many parts of the state by doggers. And then a smaller version of, uh, of a foothold trap, the Vic number three, which is what we were using and is commonly used for dogs and foxes elsewhere. And lo and behold, what we found that putting an LTD on the jaw made no difference to the speed of those traps. And interestingly, what we did also discover is that Victor number threes were actually much faster at closing than the bridges were, which was a, a very interesting outcome because a lot of people were of the belief that the bigger the trap, the more springs, the better and faster the trap is. Um, that bridges got four springs. The victors we used had two and they were quicker. 
So it was a good, little, nice little interesting outcome. Um, one of the problems we found uh, was with the nipples having to place them on the loaded uh, jaw. Um, that was not ideal. And I know the practice of, um, of strict, strict users has been to put them on the, the lazy jaw, but it didn't really affect our results all that much. We got some pretty good outcomes. We then decided to test whether we could um, develop a pat putty, which was um, deployed in a similar way to what Strychnin was using a cloth, so that it was a lot easier for the transition for Strychnin using uh, doggers to transition over to pat, and we tested those in the field. Uh, we had 99% of 119 dogs remove uh, the important parts of the LTD from the traps. So we know they worked and um, that the mode of delivery using the LTD or using the cloth was very effective. Just a little bit of information there. Um, you know, we, we got quite good rates of kill from, um, from using both the, the bite me uh, nipple and the pat cloth. We did have three dogs that um, went down for the count and then recovered. And we believe the first of those was because we used too much cloth over the top of the pap. It was the first dog we trialed it on. And I think the dog just couldn't get access um, to enough pap to put it over the threshold because it was covered in, in calico. Um, and the toxin we're using, unlike strychnine, um, is, is not absorbed into all of the cloth. So we've fixed that by just having a single wrap around and that overcome that problem. The other two dogs were trapped very close to um, some free available water. And we believe that that was enough to um, prevent the, uh, the pap reaching that threshold level where it turned the other way and, and they uh, were euthanized. So that was very interesting. We also had dogs that were whelping at the time. So, um, going into the uh, into the Moomba tip and uh, consuming food and then vomiting when they were caught and probably got sublethal dose. But, uh, but still, 84 to 87% efficacy is quite good. We also looked at the time to death uh, for the population. And you can see here um, the, one of the, um, the, the, the fastest uh, deaths we had was um, 30 minutes after being caught. That's not 30 minutes after it got a dose. Uh, that was too hard to tell exactly how quickly after they got trapped, they got a dose, but they were trapped. And within 30 minutes, the, the, some of those dogs were down. Um, the average was around 59 for females, 79 minutes for males using those nipples, the bite knee nipples. And um, um, between 24 and 187 minutes for the pap cloth. But um, the next step for this project is to go through and actually uh, mark the behaviours against those animals that passed away to um, describe the process of euthanasia. The other thing we played around with uh, were trap alerts, and this will um, uh, be of interest um, to Victoria. I think um, there was quite a lot of interest in a variety of different methods for doing trap alerts. We chose to go with Encounter Solutions from New Zealand. And um, what we did was uh, work a system together where we had uh, what we call a mole underneath the trap, not connected to the trap in any way, and using a magnetic switch that when a dog was trapped and the jaw closed, it broke a, um, a magnetic field sent a message to a mini hub that we called a bat, and then transferred that onto uh, another hub called an albatross. And that then sent a um, satellite message to Innovate, uh, to Encounter Solutions cloud server. And then that sent a message back to me on my phone. And we're talking um, sub two minutes from capture to me getting a message saying there's a dog in a trap. That was the aim. We were um, wanting to test this in Australia. It had been used on cage traps elsewhere, but not um, the uh, not on jaw traps. Obviously, we played around and developed what we wanted, so that we didn't have cables everywhere. Uh, and obviously, um, 
the mechanism for a box trap is very different to a jaw trap. And being, uh, having been a trapper for a very long time and knowing how fastidious dogs, foxes and cats are around traps, we were trying to minimize anything that might attract the animal to, um, um, to not put his foot in the right spot, basically. So we did some transmission testing using all of the different components. Um, that there is the, the mole or the, uh, the little magnetic device that sits below the trap and basically what you do is um, you have a magnet on the jaw, a very small magnet on the jaw about the size of um, uh, uh, like a Panadol, even smaller than that, probably half the size of a Panadol tablet on the jaw, so very light and that was enough to uh, trigger the reed switch when it when it lifted off the top of the uh, the mole that sent the switch and the message off to um, to the system. Um, the transmission distances vary depending on which part of the system you're looking at, but we got uh, upwards of 20 k's between traps um, where they would communicate to each other. The, the little mole that we put underneath the ground, we got up to 900 meter transmission uh, between that little mole and the, um, the bat node. Uh, which was basically our little repeater system. Okay, so both of those um, devices were, were really tested to try and improve outcomes for animals that were uh, involved in trapping programs, both by one, trying to uh, encourage euthanasia soon after capture, or in the case of the trap alert, um, very much driven by Victorian um, issues of um, uh, you know, trying to get out to, uh, to traps every 24 hours, which was proving difficult and only to turn up and see nothing in any traps and uh, trying to save uh, resources, but also ensure that when an animal was trapped, that somebody was aware as soon as it happened so that those animals could be dealt with as quick as possible after capture. So both of those, I think, were uh, very successful and um, the trap alert is being used um, by quite a few groups now um, in, in our form and um, the LTDs or the Pat Putty uh, is, um, is available in the market as well. So I'll just swing over to the other interesting part of the Cooper Basin project, um, which was to look at, from a management perspective, putting collars on dingoes and then trying to work out how they use the landscape so that they can be managed better. So we're talking about a mine site which has thousands of uh, miners every day. Um, they have massive waste facilities and there is a considerable amount of um, food scraps from those <clears throat> food halls and, uh, that go into the waste management facility. And there is also a lot of water around because water is required for both um, maintenance of the factory and for provisioning for the services for human needs on the, on the mine site. But providing food and water in the desert um, to dingoes uh, has its problems. <clears throat> and of course, um, these are the areas where you've got super abundance of dingoes. I would be nothing for me to go out and put 12 traps in the ground and over the space of seven or eight days catch 30 dogs and there'd be plenty more dogs around. So high capture rate and, um, and those dogs were starting to cause problems at the airport when uh, planes were landing. They're also uh, becoming quite domesticated and um, troubling miners. They would steal things from out the front of the, um, the miners' quarters. And if doors were left open, they'd go inside and, and, and root through all their gear and walk off with their helmets and all sorts of stuff. But there are also a few occasions where um, animals posed a risk of bite uh, inflicted injury because there was just so many of them and they got so used to seeing people, they weren't really worried anymore until they got threatened or um, someone went to pat one and then all of a sudden they'd strike. So the mine had an environmental responsibility to do something about it and they asked us if he would help in trying to um, um, give them some advice on how they could better manage those uh, populations. So we collared 27 dingoes um, in, in that one site. 
interesting, we, we were able to break the dogs up into three different types of dog. And these were based on behavior and activity. The first of these were the tipped dingoes. So these are the ones that um, stayed within the confines of the waste management facility. Um, you know, very small activity areas of just a few Ks. Um, very rarely, very, very rarely went anywhere else except hung around in the tip. We had a second category, which we called the peripatetic dingoes, and they were dogs that spent time in the tip and spent time outside of the tip. Bit of 50-50. They were um, happy to spend a lot of time feeding and, and drinking in the tip, but they'd also go out into the desert a little bit. And then we had our desert dogs, and these are the dogs that actually lived in the desert. They were just um, going for a foray one day and got caught in one of my traps, but very rarely did we see them come back uh, into the uh, the waste management facility or into the compound of the campus of the of the mine site. So three different types of dogs here based on um, their activity and um, the areas and the distance they would go. As you can see here, um, these are the dogs along the bottom. Uh, here's the kilometres away from the previous points that they were captured. And you can see the tip dogs, you know, somewhere around the 8Ks here is probably about the maximum that they went away from the um, from one previous capture or detection. Um, in this case, the peripatetic dogs up to 40Ks and then these dogs are out, you know, hundreds of kilometres out into the desert. So it's interesting finding, um, very interesting uh, when you look at the DNA uh, in a minute that this category of dog here, the desert dingoes. What it allowed us to do is to look at each of these animals in relation to the mine and this green area here is, is actually the mine site and then look at how they're using the landscape around that area. This gave us an idea of what sort of a buffer zone we would require if we were going to implement a broad acre management program. As you can see, Inaminka's up here. Between Inaminka and the Cooper Basin mine site was about a hundred and something kilometres. So this particular dog, um, actually went uh, nearly uh, three quarters of the way to Inaminka and had quite a big home range. This is a little plot of, uh, of quite a few of our dogs that were um, the, um, the dingo desert dogs. You can see here's the one we just showed you a minute ago over here. Um, this section in the middle is the uh, waste management facility and the, and the campus. Uh, and the actual camp, sorry. But you can see these dogs were moving out into the desert and using uh, both the resources that were available to them. Interestingly, out of 124 dogs that I took samples from over a few years, we only came up with 20 family groups over, that's from dogs from 2015 until 2019. But only 27% of the dogs that we collected were actually related to other dogs in the Moomba population. So what that's telling us is that there's a lot of fluidity and a lot of activity going um, between uh, the dogs in the desert into the mine site and back out again. A really interesting finding for us. And in fact, when we looked at the uh, the structure of the um, of the dogs in that area, they had relatives in the Kimberley Desert. So that's a pretty uh, pretty significant. Um, finding for us. And basically what we've done now is we have used all of the information that we've collected on activity, on um, reproductive observations, on uh, the morphology of the animals and on um, the disease of those dogs because these dogs get quite sick at certain times of year. And we've presented that to, um, to the mining company to help them with trying to improve uh, the management of that site um, in the Cooper Basin. And to a large degree, like is being recommended elsewhere, the easiest way to do that is to use fencing to exclude them from those resources that we don't want them to get to, which is food and water, in particular the waste management facility, but also to design control programs that not only deal with just that site, but they actually include buffer zones around the outer um, outer perimeters of the home range that we've recorded for those dogs so that we can slow the process of immigration back into uh, the Cooper Basin mine site. 
Yeah, Kim, I saw your message um, on the uh, the recent um, televised story from Victoria. Yeah, it's um, uh, it was a bit of a shame, I think, that there weren't other people involved in in that story. Um, just to give it a bit more uh, breadth, if you like. Um, I think we're very lucky that there was a couple of uh, very good um, shots uh, fired by the uh, by the trapper, uh, luckily, um, which was great to see. Otherwise, that would have caused a lot more grief. Um, but look, we've known for some time that we're under under pressure, and that's why we've been spending so much time over the last couple of decades trying to um, recommend standards for the use of foothold traps. And I think we've made serious inroads to the point where one of the papers that we published on the um, on the PAT uh, LTD, I put into an international journal, and that led to us being in, in Australia being invited to an international symposium on predator trapping, which had never happened before. Um, so we got a chance to give a couple of papers at that. Um, uh, my colleagues. Um, Guy Ballard, Peter Fleming, Dean Smith, and um, Ben Allen and I gave a couple of papers at that forum on what we do and the things that we try and do to improve animal welfare outcomes. Um, sadly, that didn't get a mention. Um, and we've worked with the North American um, trapping researchers to try and develop um, guidelines for international standards that embrace our needs as well as the Northern Hemisphere, because they're very different. And, and none of that was uh, was raised either, which I think was a shame because the, um, you know, the selling point in us giving those talks is that we've been recognised for the effort that we've put in to try and make trapping in this country uh, available, but more humane and, and you know, and, and for us to all adopt best practice. I think we've still got some way to go and those um, documents which I'm happy to send to you if you want to have a read. One in particular has got lots of recommendations about where we think we need to go, which to some people will be horrifying because they don't want to see um, too many constraints and restrictions put in and around the use of, uh, of, of traps. But I think um, there's some absolutely critical elements that we need to adopt to make sure that we are um, operating at a very high level of best practice when it comes to the use of foothold traps.